I am honored to introduce Michael Ames to all of you. Michael is a writer and a reporter who has written about many uh, topics, including politics and environmental issues. His writing has appeared in several publications, including The Atlantic, Harper's Magazine, and Newsweek. Newsweek. Uh, this evening, he will be talking about his new book, American Cipher. The book is a riveting account about the desertion and subsequent five years of captiv- captivity under the Taliban, ta- Taliban of private uh, first-class Bo Bergdahl. Drawing from more than 100 interviews, Michael and his co-author, Matt uh, Farwell, creates an intense portrait of Bergdahl and the foundering war in Afghanistan uh, that led to his des- uh, decision to desert. Um, Kirkus Reviews, in the review of the book, calls it an unsettling and riveting book filled with the mysteries of human nature. Everyone, let us all welcome Michael Ames. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Bernard. Thank you for everyone who turned out tonight for your interest in this book that we think is important and to Politics and Prose for hosting. Um, I'd like to start with a question. Why on this date should any of us still care about Bo Bergdahl? We have plenty of reasons we've been told not to care about Bo Bergdahl. No one forced him to join the army. No one told him to walk away from his post and from his buddies in a war zone. His act was premeditated. He even mailed home his things before he did it. He cost us the most lopsided prisoner exchange in modern US history. After he got home, he went gabbing about it all to a Hollywood screenwriter. And finally, according to the commander in chief, he is a dirty, rotten traitor. But our book argues something different. Our book argues that not only does Bo Bergdahl matter, he symbolizes a critical moment in the country's history, and whether intentionally or not, forces us to confront truths about the country's longest war that our government and the media are either unable or unwilling to say out loud. Bergdahl's legacy is visible today, right now, in the peace talks happening in Doha, Qatar, that aren't making a lot of news, but where President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo are negotiating with the same five Taliban that were traded for Bergdahl nearly five years ago. But before this was history, it was a real life event that our sources lived through and then shared with us to help make sense of it all. I'd like to read a couple of passages that speak to these issues and before we open it up to questions. And I'm gonna start um, in Kabul on the morning of Bergdahl's disappearance. One of our most critical sources is an American officer who was gathering intelligence that day in the first hours of the crisis. The American operations officer, Major Ron Wilson, sat cross-legged and barefoot on woven rugs at the tribal liaison office in Kabul when he felt his his flip phone vibrate in his pocket. He was there for the day's jirga, a traditional assembly where leaders gather to discuss the issues facing their tribes and make decisions by consensus and according to the codes of Pashtun Wali. Wilson wore his usual work clothes for Afghanistan, jeans, a long sleeve shirt, and a ball cap, and the tribal elders sat in a wide circle around him, wrinkled men in black turbans with flowing black beards, and for the oldest men, white beards dyed with henna. Back home, Wilson was clean-shaven. Here, he grew his beard to show respect. Not as long or as full as the elders, but a small gesture to the people whose trust was the currency of his work. The jirga was held in the big room on the building's second floor. Tribal leaders arrived in little yellow taxis. The larger the gathering, the farther they would travel. Some had been driving for days. After they arrived, they performed wudu, ablutions on their feet, faces, and hands. They prayed, and then they talked. They talked about the new school being built, the well being dug, the goat that was killed by the American bomb, the government collaborator who was killed by the Taliban. Talking was why they were there, along with the tea and the food, a generous spread of dried fruits, nuts, and sweets to fuel the hours. Wilson was there to listen. About 50 tribal leaders had gathered, many of them Kuchis from the violent border provinces of Paktika, Paktia, and Coast, the P2K of ISAF NATO parlance. There were some Zadran leaders too, recognizable by their jet black hair and dark eyes. Based in the southeastern provinces, their tribe was one of the country's most mercurial and most violent. They shared ancient ties and kept strong ongoing relationships with the Afghan Taliban and the Haqqanis. 
Wilson knew the Zadrons at the Jurder were friendlies, though, and they seemed more interested in the hashish and scotch stashed in an upstairs room than they were in him. Wilson stood up and walked out of the main jurga, past the pile of plastic sandals the Afghans left by the entrance, and stepped into the hallway to take the call. Hey, his boss said, we got a lost puppy. He listened to the news and peered down to the courtyard, where the younger men helped with chores while their elders met upstairs. The competing smells of burnt goat fat and hashish mixed in the air. A 23-year-old army private lost near the Pakistani border was bad news. Receiving the call at the Jirga, surrounded by tribal leaders from the districts where kidnapping was a thriving business, that was just good timing. Wilson walked back into the room and got to work. He raised the subject of kidnapping for profit with the elders. Was it a problem they were familiar with? Wilson didn't mention the missing soldier. He didn't need to. The elders had an unparalleled institutional memory, and if they didn't know the answer to Wilson's questions, they would help him find someone who did. A Kuchi elder from the East told his story about how three of his own men were recently taken hostage as a money-making venture for a local criminal gang. When the captors killed one of them, the elder paid $20,000 apiece to save the other two. Wilson posed a hypothetical. If an American was kidnapped in Paktika, what would happen to him? The tribal leaders explained the kidnapping business model in their home provinces. They named specific individuals and villages that formed the nodes of an illicit underground rat line network that used taxi cabs and safe houses <clears throat> to stage and move weapons, drugs, and valuable human cargo. The kidnappers would make frequent stops, never driving more than an hour or two, and they would make a predictable sequence of calls as they sought payment to process the hostage up the Taliban's regional chain of command. Where would they take him, Wilson asked. There was no ambiguity. Every scenario led to the same destination. Bergdahl would be delivered to the Haqqanis in Pakistan. It was, predict it was as predictable as it was discouraging. Once Bergdahl crossed the border into the Fatah, there would be no straightforward way to bring him back. Wilson knew he didn't have much time. He thanked the elders, left the Jirga, and started making calls to his network of sources, regardless of their affiliation or background. They called Taliban lawyers, friendly mullahs, and officers in the notoriously corrupt Afghan border police. The more people Wilson called, the more he learned. He was told which models of deception the Taliban would use to mask Bergdahl's movement, how they would spread invented stories designed to embarrass the Americans, and how it would end. A ransom, a prisoner trade, or a high-profile execution video. Men like Wilson did not deal with the world's nice people. He was tasked with protecting America from those that would do her harm. In America's post-9-11 global war on terror, we don't negotiate with terrorists is an oft-repeated government mantra. It's also an idea that Wilson characterized as a political nicety divorced from the reality he faced in Afghanistan. Wilson cites an Afghan saying, there are no bloodless hands, as a truism that applied to his own work. We talked to guys who were clearly Taliban. They would tell you they believe in the mission and the goals of the Taliban. By the end of the first day of the Dust One, Wilson had a multi-sourced and corroborated forecast for the Army's missing soldier. We knew how they were going to move him, where they were going to move him. We figured it would be 48 hours at the most before he was across the border. Now, I should clarify, um, there are a lot of acronyms in the book, and sometimes uh, I forget to spell out military speak. So the DUST-1 is a military acronym that stands for Duty Status Whereabouts Unknown, which has replaced MIA in the current military parlance. Um, so that's one view of the day. And now I'm going to skip forward <clears throat> to um, about two weeks later, 13 days later, once the consensus had formed in the intelligence community that Bergdahl was over the border, a fact that was buried while officers on the ground learned to use the crisis to their own advantage. Um, they did this not just in those opening days, but this went on for a period of months. <clears throat> Um, I'll also note here, CENTCOM is Central Command, which is the military command that uh, led the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq from Tampa Bay. And we quote um, our source here, Amber Dock, who was CENTCOM's lead intelligence analyst on the case. <clears throat> One sec. <laughs> on July 13th, so 13 days later, Bergdahl's captors dressed him in a light blue salwar kameez and sat him cross-legged in front of a small table with a black microphone and a glass of neon yellow soda. While the camera rolled, an unseen man asked him questions in accented English and held his dog tags up to the camera lens to identify him. 
When the Taliban released the video for worldwide broadcast six days later, U.S. intelligence analysts noted that his captors had had time to dress him in clean clothes, shave his head, make a show of feeding him on camera, and record, edit, and distribute a 28-minute video. Clearly, they were in a safe place. The day after the video aired, ABC News cited military sources involved in the search who said the Bergdahl was already in Pakistan. The Pentagon insisted that he was not, and in an interview later that day in New Delhi, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton dodged the question entirely. We are attempting to do everything we can to locate him, she told ABC's Martha Raddatz. By July 18th, nearly all U.S. intelligence agencies monitoring the case updated their assessments to reflect the new reality. Bergdahl was in Pakistan. <coughs> CENTCOM was the only holdout. At Bergdahl's court-martial more than eight years later, Doc testified that when she updated her team's assessment after the video's release, her superiors at CENTCOM did not accept her analysis and instead demanded an unprecedented level of certainty. Doc had joined the Army shortly after 9-11, and in a 16-year career that had taken her to assignments at the Pentagon, Guantanamo Bay, and Afghanistan, this was the only time her chain of command had rejected her analysis. She was frustrated. You pay us to tell you what we think, then you tell us you don't want us, you don't want to know what we think, she said later. Doc started getting calls from analysts at other intelligence agencies, grilling her about CENTCOM's balking. The implications were obvious. The war in Afghanistan was being fought in Afghanistan. And when all available intelligence pointed to the fact that Bergdahl had been moved to the wrong side of the border, into a country where the Pentagon was not at war, CENTCOM withheld its own analysis and continued to carry out searches for the missing soldier in the only battle space where it legally could. As the searches carried on past the time when military and government leadership knew that Bergdahl was almost certainly in Pakistan, the Army began focusing on its own information control. Task Force Geronimo Soldiers, which was Bergdahl's unit, were given non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, agreeing to never discuss the Dust One searches. Joshua Cornelison, the platoon's medic, remembers being in a manic haze, rushing around Sharana for food and a shower, when an officer told him and his comrades to line up against the wall and sign the papers. The contract was written in awkward legalese, but Cornelison remembers the point was clear. We weren't going to talk about it. In the weeks and months that followed, the NDAs would reach thousands of personnel, some men were told that if they didn't sign them, they wouldn't fly home. As the Dust One spun into its third and fourth weeks of what most soldiers saw as sustained madness, Sergeant Johnny Rice discerned the logic at work. He was leading his men into air raids, air assaults, and hard knocks, kicking down doors and stirring up Taliban before sunrise. Earlier in his deployment, Rice had been frustrated by counterinsurgency's strict rules of engagement, the extensive intelligence needed to detain suspected Taliban. But during the Dust One, his superiors approved every raid. If it was a mission to retrieve Bergdahl, it was an instant green light. Get it done as fast as you can, he said. From an infantryman standpoint, we were do finally doing our job for once. Sergeant Rice was hit by eight IEDs in two months, and the brain injuries he suffered sidelined him from a month of further patrols. It was extremely tiring. It was terrible, but it was the right thing to do as far as using the opportunity, he said. They took the opportunity, and I 100% stand behind it. For officers and mission planners, the vanished soldier had taken on a new life as an internal military tactic. Bergdahl became a language tactic to get assets, one former Blackfoot Company officer explained. For officers sending their men on dangerous patrols in a confusing war, it was easier to say we're looking for a guy rather than send them on just another pointless order mission. He said that this ruse went on for months. For the men in his own platoon, Bergdahl became the war's central, unreal reality, the embodiment of the contradictions and confusion that had surrounded them from the start. But even when they knew the Dust One had become a sham, they embraced it. We tried to do every mission to the best of our ability, Cornelison said, even when we knew that Bergdahl wasn't even in Afghanistan. So um, at this point, I hope that raises enough questions that we can open it to the floor for question and answers, and I can elaborate and go into more detail. Does anybody have any questions? You in the back. Did anyone get in trouble for violating the non-disclosure agreements in talking to you or anyone else? Could you repeat the question so that uh, it's on the audio? Oh, right. I'm going to repeat the question so it's on the audio. Um, 
Did anybody get in trouble for breaking the non-disclosure agreements with me or anyone else? No, no, they didn't. Um, they, the first time, I mean, they were broken after he was exchanged. It started breaking, um, sort of, uh, it was like a dam bursting. I mean, Cody Full, who was in the platoon with him, went on Twitter. He acknowledged with a case of beer and started talking about it because the story that was getting out there, and at this point that had already been the press conference in the Rose Garden, and the Obama administration was presenting this as a political victory. So these guys in his platoon started speaking out slowly. And then, as we get into in the book, six of them were flown to New York by Fox News for um, a big exclusive world interview that some of you might remember. Can you, um, is this working? Well, anyway, I'm talking. Um, <laughs> can you, you, you spoke in the beginning about the, the prisoner exchange and the five people. And I know, I know that the, the big criticism of Bergdahl is that there was this, there were five people for one and there's, you know, there's all that, all they're all about that. But can you talk about those five people? Yeah. Did that get picked up on the mic? Yes. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, the five men who just you want some details about the five and whether, so a little bit of a backstory. Um, so the five who've been described as bloodthirsty terrorists, vicious terrorists who the president called some of the five worst killers and who were out on the battlefield trying to destroy us. None of that is true. Um, in fact, Two of them had publicly surrendered and were working with the CIA at the time of their detainment. And the other three were also already working with or in the process of trying to work with American intelligence in late 2001 and early 2002. At that time, while they were working with us for reasons that remain fairly shrouded, um, but that the most reporting says come from Donald Rumsfeld, they were packed up and shipped off, shipped off to Guantanamo where they lived for the following 12 plus years. Uh, they've been living... Once they really, and just to get a little more detail on that, one of them was when he was meeting with U.S. intelligence in Afghanistan, was offering to wear a GPS locator to lead Americans to Mullah Omar, his boss at the time. Um, Americans, whether or not they believe this was legitimate, put him in Guantanamo, and on his official Pentagon papers listing reasons why he was there, the top reason was to help us find Mullah Omar. So they lived in a strange, surreal, um, but they also lived as prisoners of war. And according to other reports and reporters who were down in Guantanamo, those five men, unlike many of the other uh, detainees, expected to be released at some point. The Taliban expected a trade for years, even though in American political norms, it looked like an outrageous idea. Uh, they've been living in Doha, Qatar for the last five years, almost five years. And a couple of months ago were announced that they would be part of the delegation, the Taliban peace delegation that U.S. Uh, diplomats are currently negotiating with. So a rich irony there. Yes, good afternoon. Um, prior to his going overseas, was he or his uh, fellow soldiers given any training about what to do in lieu of a kidnapping, number one? And who else besides soldiers were being kidnapped in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Great questions, both. Um, on the first one, uh, he was given minimal training. Every, I mean, a soldier at his level, he was private first class at the time. So he had very, very minimal training. And uh, considering the minimal training he had, the debriefers who, who, who reintegrated him were pretty impressed by how he was able to withstand five years of isolated captivity, despite only having the most basic survival, escape, resistance, and evasion training. Um, your sec and your second question was about other well, kidnappings. Well, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. When I was uh, in Colombia, ranchers, I remember one. Yeah. Right. And uh, the question is um, in other countries, in Syria, and this gentleman mentions his time in Colombia, all sorts of people were kidnapped for ransoms um, from children to to ranchers. Um, yeah. And that was going on. I mean, I can't speak of any, well, there were two children held in captivity after they were born in captivity to an American and Canadian couple in Pakistan. But in Pakistan and Afghanistan, to answer your question, kidnapping was a thriving business. And it had been for years. And 
just prior to Bergdahl, the third in a series of high-profile Western journalists had been um, kidnapped and then escaped, shockingly. David Rode, do you remember the name David Rode? Right. So David Rode, who was at the New York Times at the time, and we get into this in the book, um, there's a whole section on all of the kidnapping that was going on, including with Jeer Van Dyke, Sean Lanyon, and David Rode, who are all high-profile, experienced Afghanistan journalists who one would think wouldn't have wound up in that situation. But the Taliban was able to construct really elaborate traps and schemes to have these people um, uh, abducted. And uh, Bergdahl was, was walked off base nine days after David Rode escaped. So for the Taliban, it was just the best possible timing because they had just lost their most high-value Western hostage. Um, during Bergdahl's court-martial two years ago, I think it was the week, just days prior to the final verdict, uh, Caitlin Coleman, uh, Todd Coleman and Todd Boyle and Caitlin Coleman, the Canadian American couple was released in a sort of similarly elaborate, um, show that was reported one way initially that they were caught in the back of a car. And then after time went on, it seemed much more likely that this was a, a, a planned release. Any more questions or I'll have to start reading again. <laughs> How are you? Uh, I think I, maybe I'm not alone here, but um, I listened to season two of Serial where Bo is uh, the subject. And I was reading an interview last week where your co-author, I think, um, was interviewed about the book in, in the New York Times. And he said something about the Serial folks. He described them as um, scummy and exploitative. I think was his word, or scummy and exploitative, maybe. Sounds um, familiar. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, and so I would, uh, I was just curious if you could just talk about if you just, I mean, I know obviously he said it, not you, but I'm curious if you could just expound on that and sort of what he meant by that, and if you, you all agree in that and all everything. No, thanks. Um, Matt said it, and and I agree with it. It's 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 strong language, but uh, look, um, as we as we mentioned in the book, uh, three days after Bergdahl landed on American soil. And he was a traumatized, just returned, longest held prisoner of war since Vietnam. He got a call from Mark Bull, who is a Hollywood screenwriter and director. And that later that day, Mark Bull and Catherine Bigelow, who created Zero Dark Thirty and The Hurt Locker, put out a big announcement, splashy announcement in Deadline Hollywood, that they would be producing the life story of Bo Bergdahl. That then went quiet for several months, and while the court martial was dragging on and there wasn't much new news and the movie was sort of stalling out, and then through channels and methods that remained somewhat mysterious, um, those tapes of Mark Bull interviewing Bergdahl on background research, so sorry to take a step back, he ended up calling Bo Bergdahl and under the auspices of I'm doing research for a film one day, recorded about 25 hours of interviews with him. Those interviews were then transmitted to um, the Serial podcast in New York, and that formed the basis of that podcast season, which some of you may have listened to as well. Um, I do think it's exploitative because he had just come back and he was not really in a position to speak. I mean, he spoke so raw in some of those interviews and they're, they're valuable. Don't get me wrong. And they were amazing to listen to. Um, but I think to air those interviews, to, to have the interviews is one thing, but to air the interviews days before a decision was coming down on the, the outcome of his military justice trial raised serious ethical questions, um, that no one ever really answered for. And that many people still believe determine the outcome of his legal case. Uh, uh, I didn't listen to any of the serial stuff. I am very curious if you know and um, whether you were able to ask him, or I know I've read enough of the book to know you've talked to his parents. Like, did you ask his parents? What do you honestly think he was thinking the night he uh, walked off the base? <clears throat> Well, he gave um, a full accounting of this to the Army in a series, two days of interviews. I think he talked for over, um, it was over 10 hours at least. Um, and he gave his reasons, which if in his description, and it's a 370-page 
transcript of his interview. And you can check his descriptions against now other evidence that came in during the trial. And there's no reason to believe, based on looking at, at and, and, and comparing these two things, that he wasn't being honest. It's also something that the general who interviewed him, General Dahl, looked into himself. He, the first thing he did when he started interviewing guys who were in Bergdahl's platoon is he said, what do you think Bo Bergdahl's going to tell me? Is he going to tell me a tall tale? Sounds like he has a pretty wild imagination. And they said, all of them said, we think he'll tell you the truth. So he had a eccentric personality, to put it mildly, but he had also a serious code of ethics and a reputation among those who knew him for being 100% honest. Um, so I believe that he was being honest in those transcripts, but that's a very background and roundabout way to not fully answer your question. He said that he wanted to, in the middle of the night, sneak from one base in Afghanistan to another about 18 miles away. Now, a lot of guys who fought with him said that sounded completely insane and impossible, but they were at the same altitude in Idaho, uh, in Afghanistan, as he grew up in Idaho. And that 18 miles was roughly the same distance that he used to bike and hike from his parents' house to the job he worked at 18 miles north. Um, so even if you just look at where he's from in southern Idaho and you look at videos and photos of the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, they look similar. The terrain is similar. The growth is similar. The Bergdahls talked about having people show up from the government and saying at their backyard while he was captive and saying to them, it is stunning how similarly your backyard, where Bo grew up, looks to where we're fighting right now. So I think that also gave him a real, probably false sense of security and only made his growing anxiety before he did this stunt uh, all the worse. Now, his goal, he said, his stated goal was to go out there and cause a I mean, he, he was trying to cause an alarm to go up the chain of command. He had no idea. He did not have a good enough grasp of the military chain of command to realize just how big the response would be, but he was trying to trigger a response. He was trying to trigger a response so that he would also, uh, once he turned up safe and sound with no gun at this other base, be seen as some sort of legendary guy, a legendary badass outdoorsman who did something incredible that only a real operator could have done. And about 20 minutes after he stepped outside the wire, he realized that that probably wasn't going to happen. And he realized he was in over his head. And then he started to change plans on the fly. And then he got lost, not completely lost, a little lost. And he started looking for motorcycle tracks to try to find IEDs that the Taliban were planting. And he just started to spin a little bit. He had a disguise with him. Um, at one point, he said to General Dahl, I've never uh, worn a disguise before or bribed anyone, but I, he knew from, from movies he had seen, he said that this would work. So he put on his disguise, he had his money in his pocket, and he walked. And sometime close to noon, uh, he heard the motorcycles of the Taliban coming for him. Yes? The question is, what's his hometown, which is Haley, Idaho, which is about uh, 12 miles south of Sun Valley. And so he grew up in that whole community. Um, and the second one was about his appeal. He, the verdict at the end of the trial, at the end of the court-martial last November, was November 2017, was um, dishonorable discharge, reduction in rank, and a fine. And dishonorable discharges are automatically appealed. So his case is appealed. Uh, the outcome of that appeal remains unknown. It, it's still pending. Yeah, I should say it's still pending. Yes. How do you feel about him? Are you sympathetic towards him? I mean, uh, military search for the guy put a lot of people in danger. He was doing this weird thing. How do you, how you, what's your view of him? Um, it's a good question. Oh, yeah. What is my personal view of him um, based on everything that happened uh, and people who were put in danger? My opinion is, I'd say, twofold. Two things can be true at the same time. He was a guy who didn't belong there who the army let slip through the cracks and they bear responsibility for that happening. Uh, and I'm sympathetic. Well, but it's also true that what he triggered immediately spun well out 
beyond his his lone act. You know, in the book we talk about the defense arguments. The defense arguments was that was different than the government's argument. The army's argument was Bo Bergdahl did this thing. He knocked over the first domino and everything else that happened is directly his responsibility. And that's very difficult to prove. And what the defense would said was that that chain of events is very tenuous and there are countless intervening decisions and circumstances in between bad mission orders, guys sent out without the proper supplies, um, <clears throat> and Bo was closer to what you might think of as as the butterfly in the chaos in the chaos effect butterfly effect of chaos theory, right? No one blames the butterfly for flapping its wings that perhaps leads to the chaos that follows or to the weather system that follows. And I think that's that's the system at play here. Um, he did he did what he did. He admitted to it. He admitted to it from the start, um, but the degree to which he's been made a pariah and the degree to which he's been the target of seemingly everything that the military community and a lot of people in the country and on Fox news were angry about the war going wrong. And that all became that all got projected onto Bo Bergdahl doesn't make any sense. And to me, it looks like a case of people transferring frustrations about the war onto one very low ranking guy who's not nearly as responsible as they'd like to make him out to be. Continuation of these, these last two questions. Would, would you elaborate a bit from your own perspective uh, on how you believe the military handled the whole uh, the whole issue? Not 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 just simply the mission on the ground, but the entire uh, issue, including its publicizing of it uh, here at home. It's a great question. Uh, the question is, how do I feel about how the military handled it? Um, I'm a civilian. Farwell is a soldier, so he certainly knew the military a little bit better than I did, but I learned a lot through this process. I'd, I'd break it up into two different periods of time, um, before and after he returned. Before he returned, and certainly during the, the searches, what I read earlier, the fact that they used him to achieve other things. People who, who fought on the ground, that guy, Sergeant Rice, knew that he was being told faulty information but he thought that that was a good plan anyway. And I heard that from a lot of higher ranking people as well. The military uh, leveraged this to their own advantage, but they had a war to fight. And it was a pretty pivotal moment. So they defended their own commanders doing that thing that to civilians might look a little bit shifty. Um, after he came home, and certainly in the message control, I'm a little less sympathetic. Uh, the military is an institution. It operates institutionally to protect itself. And you saw a lot of that at play. I think the worst of it happened, um, I mean, it was right in that week. So Bergdahl comes home, and immediately people are celebrating. And I say people, lawmakers, Republicans and Democrats alike, Republican congressmen were tweeting, welcome home, Bo. We stand with Bo. He's, he's I, I think one of them used the word hero. Um, he's a great American hero, I think one of them said. And within two days, everything had completely turned. White became black, up became down. This guy who the POW community wanted return turned into a pariah. And that didn't just happen organically. That happened because there was a strategic communications strategy, strategic strategy put forth <laughs> by Republican operatives and led by Richard Grinnell, who's our current ambassador to Germany. He went on Fox News the day of the return and he said, this guy went looking for the Taliban and there was no evidence for it. And um, I think... I think it represents a moment when politics and political point scoring, not like this is entirely new, but completely overwhelmed evidence uh, on the matter. What is he doing today and has he read the book? Uh, he is under legal advice not to talk anymore. <laughs> So I can't tell you what he's doing today. And even if I knew, I mean, the truth is, it's the tragic truth is he'll be hiding for the rest of his life. He'll be fearing for his life for the rest of his life. Um, you know, his, his, his attorney during the trial said that he had plans to go back and get an education. Uh, from what I know about him, I certainly hope that he can do that and, 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 and lead a peaceful life. And your second question was, oh, has he read the book? Um, I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know. Something tells me he's trying to move on. Um, and certainly the last time he talked to someone in the media, it didn't go very well. So he probably would be not very trusting to, you know, to get involved with the media again. <laughs> Swell from within the military community that as soon as he was called into route, that it was a block. Like the, the people who were there, with the people who were searching for him for 24 hours a day for weeks, like, no, that's not that. What they're saying at the press conference is not actually what happened. Right. And and to be, I mean, uh, so the question is, is how do we feel about him being called a hero? How did he feel, he feel about it? Right. About well, and I think it's worth noting, the administration never called him a hero. The press conference, it presented him in a light of this is a political victory that we got this guy back. <laughs> I think there was one congressman who called him a hero, but the administration in the White House didn't call him a hero, but they did present him in this way that really ticked off the guys who fought with him because they went, well, he's being presented as this great thing. Not only was he not a hero and not a uh, exemplary soldier by walking off, but how can we present this five for one trade as some sort of political victory? So I think people sniff that out pretty quick. Um, and I don't begrudge them their feelings. I mean, it makes sense. They, they, they only knew one thing. And what was really interesting in, in researching and writing the book was, uh, and you'll see there's an account by, there's a very smart, uh, former officer who was searching for him at the time by the name of Nate Bethay. He wrote a column that made a lot of news that week that said, we lost six guys looking for Bergdahl. Well, Nate didn't know the full context. I mean, we're, the, the book's about Bergdahl, but, but it's about much more than Bo Bergdahl. It's about everything that happened after what he did. And when this officer, Bethay, went back and, and saw what had happened, he realized that he did not have the accurate information and perhaps he'd even been misled. Those six soldiers who died doing following orders and doing everything they were supposed to do and they and their families can rightly think of them as heroes but they died two months a month to two months after the intelligence community already knew that Bergdahl was no longer there so when you have dozens of veterans who can come out and say we were looking for Bergdahl for months that's true that's their truth that's the war that they fought but at the same time that is not the reality on the ground at the time and that is not what was happening they were misled and I think they deserve um a clear answer. Um, Sorry. Yes. Uh, perhaps his peers might, uh, their view might be a somewhat more balanced view, i.e. his platoon peers. What, what, do you have a sense at all of what they thought about what he did? Oh, yeah. Um, not one of them was, to, every last one of them was angry at him, including my co-author. <laughs> um, including his own father. I mean, everybody was disbelieving and angry and upset that he had done this incredibly reckless thing. Uh, the platoon, you know, I quoted Josh Cornelison. The platoon um, went, six of them went on Fox News to express that anger. They were extremely furious about what had happened and what they felt was a story that they were not allowed to tell because they were forced to sign these non disclosure <laughs> agreements. Now, Beyond those guys who went on Fox, a couple of them thought that their words and feelings had been twisted, had been twisted to use for political point scoring. Two of them talked extensively to us for this book. And it's, in it's I interesting to me that they, they were not the ones who were called on to Fox News there, or any cable news station or media in general. There isn't a lot of um, traction in hearing some of his best friends in the platoon say, you know, I was incredibly angry at him then, but I'm ready to forgive him now. And I think there's value in that. And I think the news media that got this wrong in so many ways uh, has a responsibility to also help right that wrong. You know, some of them asked me if they could contact him because they wanted to speak to him person to person. They considered him his friend, their friends. They considered that he betrayed them. But this is years ago. They understand that this happened in a far broader context of a war that the country was losing. And a couple of them who spoke to us are ready to move on and put it behind them. Some of them never will. As, as you know, I, I love the portraiture of Idaho in the book. Um, I think all your reporting from your experience in Idaho 
so I was going to ask whether you think that Bo's story is an Idaho story. And I was like, is, is Bo's story an American story? Is this an American story? The question is, is, uh, is Bo's story an Idaho story, and is it an American story? Uh, it, yes to both. Um, it's definitely an Idaho story, and I lived in Idaho in his hometown during the period of the first three years of his captivity. And people there, under people who knew him, it's a small town, it's a small community, people who knew him understood it on a slightly different level, and they were aware that he probably didn't belong there in the first place. And you send a kid who doesn't belong there in the first place into that kind of situation and bad things might happen. So I think people knew that there. And like I was saying before about the topography and the climate in which he grew up, it also explains a bit of what was in his mind. And of course, it's an American story because what he did, this crazy thing, thinking that he himself could fix it, that he himself could do better than all of these institutions that were there to do these things, is a perfectly American story. It's, it's what many characters in the book do. It's what our current president says he does. It's what Mike Flynn did at the time that, of, that this book takes place and continued to do. So there is something inherently American about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, in, in 2016, there's a lot of uh, misinformation through social media. I remember personally seeing, uh, you know, like political memes, you know, being weaponized using Bo Bergdahl to, you know, push an election um, agenda. I'm curious if you can list like just off the top of your brain, like some of the most egregious falsehoods about the entire situation and what, what the truth is. <clears throat> well, the most egregious is that Bob Bergdahl is a lizard person who <laughs> used his blinking to and his tongue movements to deliver coded messages to his terrorist followers. <laughs> Another one, another one was that Bo Bergdahl, when he was in the back of the pickup truck and they took the blindfold off of him and he started blinking wildly, there's a lot about blinking out there. So the blinking was also coded messages to sleeper cells of other terrorists back home in America and in Afghanistan who he was secretly communicating with. Those didn't get that much traction. I mean, that's, that's YouTube. You know, there's a pizza place a few doors down that knows a couple things about these messages, um, and it's sad, and but it's true and it happens, but you don't have to go all the way into the depths of YouTube for this. Um, on Fox News, uh, Lieutenant, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer went up there countless times and said countless things that weren't true that people absorbed as truth. Janine Pirro, um, who we all feel sorry for this week, went out there and said, Wild thing. I, I, I think she said that Bo Bergdahl called his platoon after he left and told them he wasn't coming back. I don't even know where this comes from. Um, I think a lot of it is just the news business. You know, there is a there is a real imperative to make the news snappy and fun and entertaining every day, and uh, that that can lead to some unfortunate outcomes. <laughs> Um, the question is, why didn't, why do I feel he didn't belong there in the first place? And does that mean the military? Uh, yeah. Um, he, so as you'll learn in the book, he enlisted twice. He volunteered twice for the U S armed forces. He volunteered for the coast guard and he washed out of coast guard basic training after a couple weeks with a anxiety induced panic attack. And the coast guard, uh, handled it well and said, you can't enlist in the military again until you get a waiver. Uh, until you get counseling and you get a waiver treatment. And two years later, he enlisted in the Army. That requirement was waived. The Army needed people. The Army had lowered standards. The war in Iraq was raging. And he slipped through the cracks. He was also a really unique case. You'll see in photos, he looks like a soldier. He is a big, strapping guy who knew guns perfectly, who had dreamed of being a military hero for most of his life. And... His unique, abnormal ways of thinking were not picked up very quickly by the typical um, processes that were in place. And I think one of the better things that came out of the court-martial was the military and the army looking at the way that it handles mental health cases. <laughs>
<laughs> Did the army run a social security number and find out about the Coast Guard? Um, I believe the recruiter in Southern Idaho provided him a waiver. The, the, the recruiter in Southern Idaho who said to him, if you sign the dotted line right now, uh, we'll give you a signing bonus. And you mentioned that you needed to see a counselor. You, you saw a counselor, right? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so it was waived very quickly. I wonder how much of an asset, if at all, Bo has been to the military community since he's gotten back in terms of, I don't know how many of our soldiers have been taken uh, by the Taliban, but, you know, it's certainly probably a concern moving forward. And uh, if you just speak about that, do you say you know about that? Yeah. Um, sounds like someone who maybe read the book. Uh, there, it, I think among the other tragedies of the coverage of this case and how it was done wrong, and some of it, look, I, 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 I like to beat up on the media, but a lot of this information wasn't available at the time. Um, he, there were two different versions of Bo Bergdahl in the summer that he came back. There was the version that he was a traitor and that he called his, and, and that he called his platoon and said, you know, that, that he hated them and he wasn't coming back. Uh, and there was the real version. And the real version was engaged in extensive debriefing sessions with the Pentagon, every the alphabet soup of intelligence agencies. He gave over 80 hours of recorded debriefing sessions. Shortly after he came back, and shortly after those debriefing sessions began, uh, the Obama administration ended its five-month ceasefire of drones over Western Pakistan and started hitting targets right where he had been. Um, it's all classified. The drone the drone program itself is classified. So these are not things that are out there in the news, but I think one can draw reasonable conclusions, not just, and don't take my word for it, during the court martial, um, two different people who were responsible for debriefing him called him a gold mine of intelligence. And that intelligence was used in American military interests. And that is something that he got credit for internally and he was given good conduct medals, and he was given um, the credit he deserved for doing that, but that doesn't get out into the wider public. Janine Pirro didn't write anything on that. <laughs> Janine Pirro didn't write anything on that. Also, one other thing, he uh, not only was he doing that, which was required of him, but once the requirements ended, he was invited during his court-martial to go speak at the Survival of Asian Resistance Escape School at Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington, to lecture to an audience tape-recorded on surviving these situations. And um, the, the, the gentleman who was running that program said that he never had a single complaint from anyone about Bo Bergdahl because they wanted to hear what he had been through and how he survived it. Was he tortured? Yes. Yeah. Question is, was he tortured? He was tortured extensively. He was in solitary confinement. I mean, the, the, the worst torture he probably under, I mean, who can say what one torture is worse than another, but the guy was in complete isolation for five years, which is itself torture. But there's other tortures that, um, that we spell out in the book, but I don't know if I want to, uh, no. go in detail. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, I hope. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, there's, just, there's been a lot of controversy about how the government handles the families during hostage uh, situations. Uh, in recent years, they've tried to make the, the end of the Obama administration try to make a big change in how they deal with families and to have a hostage liaison and all this stuff. How does Bergdahl's family feel about the way the government dealt with them uh, through all this? It's a good question that I want to address in two parts. The first part is, I'm going to flip it. How did Bergdahl's family feel about the way that they were handled by the government? And the second one is, how do other hostage families, how have they been uh, dealt with? So the Bergdahls first, they felt very well taken care of. It didn't turn on them until it turned politically. They were supported. They received historic, I say historic, in Vietnam we had thousands of POW families who never received the attention that they did. Um, they were grateful for that. They still to this day um, talk in unending gratitude. I mean, they're religious Christian people and they talk in deep humility and gratitude about the people who helped them through this ordeal and this crisis. And the extent of it is incredible. The extent of plans that went into reassuring that when Bergdahl got home, that he would be taken care of were, uh, as, as one of our sources said, pl pl planned to the paperclip. 
I mean, every step of every day of his reintegration had him and his mental and physical well-being primary among them. But uh, there was not a plan to match to get him home. And this is where I'd be remiss not to bring up someone who's in our audience tonight, who's <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Jason Amarine, who was one of the people who the Pentagon assigned to try to bring him home. And it was Amarine's work, um, which is, is outlined in this book and um, who, who I met while I was a reporter for Newsweek, who shed light on the fact that no one in the government was doing anything organized, not just to get Bergdahl home, but to get home uh, more than half a dozen other civilians who were being held in Pakistan. They were languishing there. And just like the families of the people in Syria, they were not dealt with very well. So um, I think thanks in large part to the work that Lieutenant Colonel Amarine did and reforms that were made as a result of his work at the end of the Obama administration that carried forward into the Trump administration. There's been a number of hostages who have been returned since the Trump administration began. And I think um, the work that was done as a result of what was discovered by Amory and others on this Bergdahl case um, was the reason that, that those improvements were made. Well, I think that about wraps us up. But thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and I hope you pick up a copy.